The next few questions come directly from some of my Patreons, patrons, patrons on Patreon. I don't really know how it works yet, how to say it correctly, but these come directly from you guys. So thanks so much for your support. Here's some answers. This first one comes from Patricio. Thank you so much, Patricio. Patricio. I don't know. Hopefully I said it right. Thank you so much for your support. His question says, greetings, Dr. Good. And my question is, how has your experience been as a professor of kinesiology? And is there any advice that you would give the next generation of kinesiology students? Um, well, that's a two-parter. So first, first of all, my experience has been amazing. It's, it's my experience that kinesiology students come ready to learn because they're passionate about uh, what they hope to go into, whether that's a movement or a health-related field. I feel like in medicine and in the movement sciences, there's so much of it is about helping other people. And so I feel like the students that I get are very other-centered already. They know why they're doing what they're doing because, and it's because they want to help people, usually because they've had an experience. Uh, maybe as an athlete, they were injured and it was a physical therapist who helped them get back to the sport that they love. Maybe it was, uh, they had an operation when they were young and it was the physician assistant who really was personable and helped them along the way, made them feel comfortable. Maybe they didn't necessarily have some sort of a mature sort of mentor figure to look up to as a kid. And so perhaps it was their coach or their strength coach who really poured into them as, yeah, they coached their sport, but more importantly, uh, helped them to grow and develop their character. And so I feel like a lot of Kinesi students have had a similar um, a, a similar experience to that. And so they're going into the field in order to pay it forward, to give back what they've already received. And they just need the schooling and the know-how and the experience um, to get there and the degree, of course. And I love helping them to achieve that. Um, so I've loved my experience as a kinesis professor. Also, I really enjoy being able to spend about 50% of my time in the classroom and the other 50% in the weight room or out on the track or in the field, like with with my students, teaching them how to train, how to train others, how to coach, how to um, you know, do palpations on the human body. It's so hands-on. And so for me, um, I love that. I love that type of variety. Part two of the question is, uh, is there any advice that you would give to the next generation of kinesiology students? And, and yes, absolutely. My advice is this, to get out of this sort of narcissistic mindset of the current generation, my generation too, of thinking of yourself, of being on social media, of taking selfies all the time, of um, you know, thinking of building yourself up. Instead, think about how you can build other people up. And this is a two, this is a, you know, two for one. Uh, couple that mindset with the mindset of self-improvement. So take criticism from people. Ask people what your flaws are. Um, look for ways that you can improve yourself, not only in your character and in your personality and how you come across to other people, but also in your craft. So for instance, if you're gonna be a physical therapist or you say you want to be, but you are not learning uh, the human body uh, with the type of passion that that would will continue for a lifetime, or if you say you wanna be a coach, but you're not investigating the latest uh, evidence-based, science-backed coaching techniques. If you say you wanna be a personal trainer, but you don't know how to use a barbell in a variety of ways, or you couldn't walk into a gym and just put together a training session, well, then you need to continue working on yourself and developing the craft. A degree does not give you license to go out and be a professional or an expert. A degree gives you just enough knowledge to begin to build that uh, set of hands-on skills. And that's what I try to do with my students. I try to get them a head start on that process by doing things like filming my lecture videos so they can watch them outside of class. And then in the classroom, we actually go deep and we go into those hands-on skills uh, and some of the soft skills that they can't really develop by reading a textbook. So my big, biggest advice to Kinesi students is work on yourself, pay attention to other people, and make sure you're honing your craft from day one. Okay, next question from Caleb, another patron. Best advice for passing the CSCS after trying everything else? Okay, and so, so for some more context, uh, he said he's, he's studied for the test, he's read the textbook, he's gone through study guides, he's watched my lecture videos, which is a really good start to passing the CSCS test. But what else, what's missing from his study habits? And what I would say, it kind of goes along with what I just said, the biggest thing that I tell my students is you have to be doing these things yourself if you really want to internalize them. If you want the knowledge to come 
uh, not just from here, not just from cramming that textbook. If you want it to come from here, right, from the heart, uh, then you have to you have to have internalized it. Uh, so instead of just designing a resistance training program for an assignment, which is a really good assignment, I give that to all of my students. What if you also implemented that program in yourself? Maybe you don't have athletes you can train. Maybe you're not a personal trainer yet, but you can go to the gym and you can uh, do that training. You can put a heavy bar on your back and you can apply the principles of overload, of specificity, of uh, exercise variation. You can apply all of that to yourself and experience what it feels like to make gains in the weight room. That's, that's one of the most important things to do. Um, you can go do a plyometric program if you want to increase your jump height. You can um, you know, work on your own uh, sports psychology. Let's say that you're an athlete, you can practice visualization techniques before the game. So take the things from the CSCS and put it into practice in your daily life. Even some of those um, more abstract chapters that deal with kind of hard physiology concepts that you might remember from anatomy and physiology from that course, you can be thinking of that while you're training. So let's say you're in the weight room and you're doing, um, maybe you're crazy and you're doing like a set of 20 on the leg press or something to finish off your hypertrophy day, it's peak week and you have like this giant set at the end. Be thinking about, maybe not during, but maybe after, <laughs> after that big set, be thinking about what are you feeling in your legs? What are some of those things that you're going through and experiencing physiologically? Is that uh, lactate buildup? What are those hydrogen ions doing? What's the um, acidity of your blood right now? And what, and what um, adaptations are you driving with that set of 20 on the leg press? So we can be thinking about all these things. And if you do it, if you live your life that way, then when it comes to test, uh, test day and you're reading that question, it just comes up out of your experience and you just know it from here. Now this next question is from another patron. His name is David and he says, um, a common question that he gets asked, he just graduated with his master's in exercise science. He gets asked the question, what job can you get from studying that from studying exercise science. Um, he goes on to say um, he would like to see my take on it, but he believes there are many transferable skills that can be applied to various career paths. And I think that's absolutely correct, David. I think um, as an exercise scientist or sports scientist, you know, obviously the direct career pathway is to become an exercise physiologist or a sports scientist or a sport physiologist, something um, in the realm of performance where you're assessing the physiological makeup of the athletes or the people that you're studying. And that's the most direct application, but it's widely transferable. And in today's sort of growing sports science and wearable and data sort of field surrounding health and fitness and performance, um, the sky is the limit. There's a lot of things open to you. So think about all the new apps that are coming out that rely on wearable devices, like this Garmin that I'm wearing right now, syncs to an app on my phone and it takes a ton of metrics like heart rate and, and step data from accelerometers that are embedded inside of it. Coupling those two things, you can get things like sleep data and number of steps and uh, velocity zones when you're training with the GPS that's embedded. And you need a sports scientist to be able to interpret those things and to be able to offer guidelines um, in order to maybe stratify the data and to tell people like how, uh, how much they should be walking or running or how, how, uh, how fit they are based on their current activity trends. Um, so think of apps, think of technology, the technology space, things like velocity-based training, things like motion capture. These require people with maybe uh, both data science and sports science and perhaps a bent towards engineering um, and technology. Uh, if you're good with computers, then data analytics. So uh, taking massive amounts of sports data or training data, organizing them into spreadsheets, uh, keeping good data hygiene, manipulating that data, sending it where it needs to go, but running statistics on it, that's also important. Of course, there are research jobs as well. Um, also, personal training, coaching, strength and conditioning. And we can even start to bridge the gap uh, where we start to pull in both strength and conditioning and sports science uh, into maybe some of the same uh, same roles. So you can be an applied sports scientist and maybe you're on the floor coaching and training athletes, but you're also collecting that data. Uh, you're doing some athlete monitoring and then you're, you're analyzing that data and using it to drive that sport performance program to feed it back to the coach and to feed it back to yourself for the training programs for those athletes, uh, present it to the athletes as well so they get that buy-in and they can you know, see where they are in their own training process. So um, a lot of options for you if you have a degree or you're pursuing a degree in exercise and sports science. 
Uh, and then the last question here comes from Chris. He's a subscriber. He says, hey, Dr. Gooden, I'm about to start a DPT program, Doctorate of Physical Therapy, and I'm thinking about getting my PhD in kinesiology afterwards. Can you do a video on how you obtained your PhD and what the process was like for anyone else who is interested? This is a great question, Chris, and I think it deserves its own video, uh, just addressing the process of, of how to apply for a PhD, what to look for in PhD programs, uh, how to select a PhD mentor, or do they select you? It depends on the school. Uh, funding, what types of research you could uh, investigate as a master's or PhD student, and then what the process is like, what's the grind like, um, and uh, of course it's program dependent, I can tell you about my program, um, and I'll tell you briefly right now, but make a video later. Um, so it was, it was a long five years. I did my master's and my PhD at ETSU, two years for the master's, three for the PhD, and it was essentially, uh, you know, like a 10 to 14 hour a day grind of getting there early, um, coaching in the weight room with the division one athletes that would come in. Uh, we were all in charge of teams from the get go, doing the strength and conditioning, doing the programming. Of course, we'd have to run it by the older or the more seasoned uh, masters and PhD students who would then in turn run it by Dr. Stone and colleagues. Um, so, you know, we had multiple checks and balances, uh, but yeah, we were sent in there to acquire experience and apply what we were learning in the classroom. Then the middle of the day was taken up with classes and GA ships. So trying to make ends meet by working over in financial services and I worked for athletics and then I had a GA ship uh, in the department. So funding is really important. Our, our program couldn't fully fund everyone at, the, at that time. Now I think the program is fully funded and I think all PhD students at ETSU do get some sort of funding, but don't take my word for it. Um, so funding is huge. And then in the evenings, it was all uh, sports science and data analysis. So any testing we had done with athletes during the day, um, also the strength and conditioning data that we had, like uh, volume loads and sets and reps, we would update that in their training sheets. Depending on the team that you worked with, if you worked with soccer, which I didn't, thankfully, they were running through GPS data, filtering it, putting together a packet for the coaches to review before the next day. So uh, we were essentially full-time strength coaches, students, and sports scientists kind of all at the same time. And it was a lot. It was like drinking through a fire hose, but it was a great hands-on experience for me. And so for five years, I was able to really rack up all of these different uh, experiences as I was pursuing my degree as well. And of course, at the same time, you're trying to brainstorm for your own thesis or dissertation project as well, usually um, in collaboration with another student, uh, with your mentor who has their own line of research that they're interested in. And I would strongly advise you to just sort of come under their wing and pursue that with them instead of trying to strike out on your own like I did and made a lot of headaches for myself. You know, it's a learning process either way, but um, if you want to uh, maybe be more efficient about it, like going underneath your uh, PhD mentor would be the best way to go. Um, and then, of course, uh, traveling to conferences, getting used to writing research, um, and all of those types of things. I also taught. Uh, by the end, I was teaching full-time at a college across town. So all that to say, it was a very challenging five years, but a very rewarding five years. And I rely on those experiences as I'm teaching every day to give context and to flesh out examples and to help my students really understand what it is we're talking about. Um, and so that I can you know, give them real life examples of, of what it might look like to apply different concepts uh, from whatever it is I'm teaching. So I'll make another video about that in the future, but thank you so much, Chris and David and Patricio and Caleb for your questions. Let me know if you guys have any questions you want me to address in a future video. Put them down in the comments, upvote the ones that you like. Um, stay tuned for more, you guys. Uh, this has been fun, and I'll see you on the next video. Dr. Gooden here back with another lecture.